Back in 2017, Platonic Games kicked off the return of the 3D Collectathon with Ukulele. And I've already talked at length about how, while it wasn't a complete failure in its concepts, it just needed a little more time in development to reach its full potential. It has received several quality of life updates since its initial release, but I was certainly bummed when I played it. It didn't have the post rareware magic I was hoping for. But these are the creators behind some of my favorite platformers of all time. So even though it left a bad taste in my mouth, I wasn't ready to count them out just yet. So when they announced their next title, more of a spiritual successor than a full sequel with a focus on 2D platforming this time around, it definitely took me by surprise. This looked more like Donkey Kong Country than Banjo-Kazooie. Maybe this would be the new direction our chameleon and bat comrades needed. I decided to give Platonic another try, and I'm so glad I did, because not only is Ukulele and the Impossible Lair a game you totally need to play, but it's also one that blew me away with its unique spins on the formula even more than the solid platforming I signed up for. Let's talk about it. Right from the get-go, this game does something a little different. It drops you into the very last stage at the beginning, the titular Impossible Lair, and it definitely lives up to its name. Capital B isn't messing around this time, and after a few tricky jumps, I realized I wasn't going to make it out of here alive. Turns out, I only got 7% through the lair. And this isn't some joke or gimmick to make sure you would die, this really is the final challenge. But luckily, there's a backup plan thanks to your new friend, Queen Phoebe. If you explore the Royal Stingdom and beat the various levels, you'll rescue squadrons from the B-talion. Jeez, heavy on the B-puns. And each recruit you rescue acts as another hit point you can take in the impossible lair. So the more you complete in the world, the better chance you'll have at conquering this insane gauntlet of terror. So you start playing through stages, and this is where the core gameplay shines brightest. It definitely has DKC vibes, but specifically returns or tropical freeze. Each level has its own distinct theme. There's five collectible coins hidden in each level, and these are used to unlock new areas throughout the game by spending them at trousers paywalls. A literal paywall, oh boy. You have your typical move set, a speedy roll, a twirly spin in the air, a ground pound, but if you lose your buddy by taking a hit, you Yuka loses a lot of his abilities, similar to DK fending for himself in the chaos, so it's always better to have a partner. Luckily, Laylee flaps around for a few seconds when you take damage, so if you're fast enough, you can grab her again and keep going. On top of this, you can collect tonics throughout the world that augment your experience in various ways. You can equip three at a time, and they range from faster movement and more checkpoints, to giving Yuka a giant head, or putting a fancy filter over the screen for fun. Each tonic has a quill modifier that will reduce or increase the amount you collect based on their usefulness. So for example, you can make Laylee stick around longer after losing her, but this will reduce your quill total at the end of the stage. But you can also make enemies harder to kill, or flip the level to increase the amount of quills you'll gain. It's a really cool system, and it was fun to mess around with what worked best for me. The quill magnet was probably the most useful, and it doesn't affect your totals in any way. Definitely a must-have. Quills replenish every time you enter a stage, and they're used to unlock the tonics you collect. So they're certainly useful, but you could also avoid tonics altogether if you really wanted to. I think they're a great addition, personally, and they make the overworld more fun to explore. In fact, the top-down map in which you find the various stages is an incredible change of pace from the regular gameplay, and might even be my favorite part of the game. There is so much to do and see here, but it's more than just finding handy trinkets. As you progress, you realize there are actually two versions of every level in the game, and you unlock them by completing tasks or challenges along the way. So for example, by blowing up this rock face guy, you'll release a stream and flood a stage with water, completely changing how you play through it. Or by turning this device full of enemies on top of another level, it becomes a deadly chase sequence where you have to outrun your impending doom. Not only does each change completely alter your path in a level, making it virtually unrecognizable from your first time through, but they're also all drastically different from each other. You'll spew honey on a stage to make it sticky, freeze fountains in another to reach new heights, or even flip one sideways to turn it into a vertical climb. It was such a joy to discover how to unlock this new alteration and see all the ways it switches things up. 
So while there's technically 20 stages, there's really 40, and no theme overstays its welcome. One of the most unique levels was a collectible quest where the bee is right at the start, but you need to explore and find five hidden gems to open its cage. I love it. As I said, the overworld has so much more than linear paths. There's hidden tonics you can find by following clues from road signs, pagey challenges that open new pathways to proceed, and even little easter eggs from the last game, and shortcuts to easily get back to previous areas. It really starts to feel like its own game separate from the platforming, and was a really really cool breath of fresh air in terms of what an overworld can truly be. This is the type of stuff I expect to see from X-Rare developers, and they really delivered on this front. So as I finished up all the stages and had an army of bee shields at my disposal, I tackled the impossible lair once again, thinking it was going to be a cakewalk, since that's how most games that handle this type of trope go. But to my humbling surprise, no, the lair is still incredibly difficult, even with all the extra help on my side. This last test is super long, and sprinkles in multiple phases of a boss fight throughout. So be ready to truly put your skills to the test here. I really liked this, it definitely felt worthy of being the final challenge, and was all the more rewarding when I overcame it. I'm sure they made it so lengthy just to make sure no one could finish it without playing the rest of the game. But then again, they have a special tonic just for beating the lair without using a single B. So sorry Gerard, I'm sure that one sucked to complete. Overall, I was incredibly impressed with Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, and it really caught me off guard with the clever design choices they implemented. If you're feeling the drought of DKC titles lately, this is a fantastic remedy in the meantime, and has a lot more to offer on top of the typical platforming we know and love. Yes, it feels awesome to speedrun through these levels and learn the extent of Yuka's capabilities, but it's also full of that cheeky Brit humor, and has easily one of the best soundtracks of the year. Every song has that beautiful David Wise and Grant Kirkhope inspiration, even though some of them aren't made by those composers at all. I recommend downloading the OST even if you never play it, it's seriously that phenomenal. While it may not be the next 3D adventure to sweep us off our feet, it definitely is a more polished and enjoyable experience overall, and I'm so glad they decided to take that leap of faith. Who knows, maybe next they'll tackle a kart racer or a third person shooter. Platonic, you crazy. So go enjoy a romp through the royal stingdom, and have fun proving that the impossible is possible. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. Hey, did you know that there's a Snowman Gaming merch store? If you want to rep your favorite snowman to all your friends, I recommend the Sunbathing Snow Globe t-shirt. Or this one with my happy face on it. This is a fantastic way to help the channel, and I would be honored if you decided to wear me. Okay, that sounded weird. Anyway, thanks for your continued support, and I'll see you later. Bye bye